with us. We love you guys. So much for your worship. Beautiful day, a little rainy outside, but it's dry in here. The spirits of the Lord's in here. How many of you could say today, God's been good to me? Anybody in the room, you can say, God has been good to me. He's been a faithful friend. We just sang about that. We're so thankful, thankful for what happened at Night of Hope and Healing. And there have been some online uh, responses, people telling us what God did. I just met a sweet lady, one of our dear sisters in the, in the aisle just a minute ago, just before service. She said, I just got to tell you, I got to tell you. She said, I came to Wednesday night. I've been dealing with terrible back issues for a year. I've been praying at home, asking other people to pray for me. For a year, it's kept me from being able to volunteer the way I wanted to. And she said, Wednesday night, God touched my body. I haven't had one back pain since. Come on, somebody. Thank you, Lord. There are many, many stories like that. We want to hear your story. We want to hear what God's done for you. And we're celebrating the goodness of God uh, in our lives. Uh, Easter season is upon us. I think we all know that. Next weekend is Palm Sunday. And then the following weekend uh, uh, all the Easter services. I, I just want to challenge you to get a friend, get a family church on, on your way out. Grab some of these invite cards, so simple to use. Just put it in somebody's hand and say, man, I wish you'd be my friend on Easter Sunday. They'll be uh, available on your way out of the service. Some of you have already got them. I hope you've already used them and need some more. Amen. Look at your neighbor and say, have you used yours? Tell, ask somebody that question. Well, get some more then because we got plenty for you and we want you to use them uh, to bring a friend to Easter at Christ Church. As a matter of fact, I want to key in today on the urgency behind that thought. And I'll look at Matthew 9, verse 35 through 38. I'm reading through the New Living Translation version of the Bible. Jesus traveled through all the towns and villages, teaching in the synagogues and announcing the good news about the kingdom. And he healed every kind of disease. He healed every kind of disease and illness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. He said to his disciples, the harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who's in charge of the harvest and ask him to send more workers. Everybody say more workers. More workers. Ask the Lord of the harvest to send more workers into the fields. This is one of the most characteristic statements Jesus ever made. And in this statement, we can see some clear differences between Jesus and the religious hierarchy of his day. When the pharisaical mind viewed non-religious people, they, they saw them as chaff waiting to be thrown in the fire. Good for nothings. People in the way. People who were devalued by the religious system. And they were viewed as less than nothing. Really, nothingness. But when Jesus saw them, he saw wheat, precious grain, waiting to be harvested, waiting to be collected, waiting to be saved. The Pharisees were looking for, even praying for the destruction of sinner people. They weren't, they weren't praying, God save them, God change them, God rescue them. They were praying for their complete annihilation. Anybody who's not just like us, who doesn't follow the law of Moses, we want the, the earth eradicated of these people. But Jesus loved sinners so much that he came to give his life so they could be saved. And so Jesus says in John 4, 35, you know the saying, four months between planting and harvest, but I say, wake up and look around. The fields are already ripe for harvest. The harvesters are paid good wages, and the fruit they harvest is people brought to eternal life. Oh, what joy awaits both the planter and the harvester alike. I want to take the next few minutes together with you to talk about the big idea from this passage and the title of my message would just simply be, The Time Is Now. Everybody say that with me, will you? The time is now. This is the, 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 the first thing that Jesus says is this, the, the fields are white, they're ripe for harvest. Now I wanted to be a farmer years ago, but I didn't make the cut. Uh, and thank God, God knew what he was doing because I have hay fever, I got allergies, dust doesn't settle too good with me, uh, the elements don't settle too good with me, I break out, I start sneezing, my eyes get watery, I can't see my hand in front of my face. I'm not a farmer, but I do understand the significance of the tops of the grain becoming white. It's an indication that the crop is overly ripe. 
So what did Jesus mean by that statement? His, it was his way of communicating the urgency that, that was in, involved in our recognizing the potential harvest all around us. Everywhere you look, the crops are ready for harvest. The worst possible scenario to a farmer is to watch his crops rot in the field with no workers to harvest them. This could be one of the most significant seasons, one of the most the, one of the greatest opportunities in all of history for the body of Christ and leading lost people to faith in Jesus Christ with all this going on in our world today. Anybody see any goings on in the world around you? Fear about our national economy? Fear about foreign adversaries? Fear of potential terrorist strikes? Fear of, of people shutting the, the electric grids down? Fear of people stealing your identity? Fear of, fear of all the political rancor, crime and lawlessness in the streets? Fear and hopelessness have the ground shaking underneath people's feet. They're in a receptive mindset. People are looking for something strong, something stable, something immovable, some rock that won't roll out from under their feet. And we know they're looking for Jesus Christ. Everywhere you turn, there are people who need a desperate do-over. They need a fresh start. What, what, the need, what they need is an encounter with Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? amen? Maybe they just moved into the neighborhood. You don't know their names yet. Maybe they've lived on your road for four years and they're within a stone's throw of the hope that you have found in Jesus Christ. Four mailboxes down. And there they sit, people who early in their life pledged to God for better or for worse until death do us part, just now end up sharing living quarters and leading separate lives, hanging on for the kids. They don't, they don't have a clue about how, what to do to bring life back to their marriage. They may live in the nicest home, drive the nicest cars. Come on, you know this is the truth. They, they may take the best vacations on the outside. They're to be envied, but inside their bones are rotting. Others are greedy, sexually deviant, self-medicated, drug and alcohol addicted, trying to drown their pain. There they are, bound in their misery, wrapped up in the tentacles of addictions. Their lives and relationships are shot to pieces. Their eyes and their countenance tells a story. All their hopes and their dreams are in total free fall. They're not living, they are just existing. They desperately need Jesus. Jeremiah 29 and 11 is a favorite passage that we love to quote and speak over our own lives. You remember it, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. But you know who that passage was originally given to? It was spoken to people in desperate, hopeless bondage. The people of Israel who had been separated from family, carted away from their homeland, and because of their rebellion as a nation to God, they've been enslaved now to the Babylonians. We quote it about ourselves, and I believe we're right in doing so, but the people that really needed the message of Jeremiah 29, 11 are those who are drowning in a cesspool of hopelessness, who don't know what you and, know, you and I know about life and about God. They don't know about the power of forgiveness. They don't know the joy that Jesus brings to a broken life. They've not yet experienced the peace and the freedom that comes in having their chains of their sinful life fall to the ground by the power of Jesus. I love that course. I hear those chains falling. While they're dying of thirst in a parched desert place, we drink daily from the cool, clear springs of living water. That's just a snapshot of the spiritual depravity and the hopelessness that many without Christ are living. And as true and as heartbreaking as that is, there have already been many seeds of the gospel and the hope of Jesus sprinkled in their lives. They're not produced a harvest yet, but they're lying there, dormant. The Bible says one plants, one waters, and God gives the increase. Seeds may have been planted from their childhood and, and they're just waiting for somebody to come along and water the seed that's been planted and somebody wa plants it, somebody waters it and maybe a, a, a year later, two years later, three years later, somebody pours water on a dormant seed and that seed begins to germinate and sprout and up through the, the crusty ground of their life shoots a little green shoot and all of a sudden the life that, 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 that God intended is given to them by the Lord himself. Lay your hand on your chest and pray this simple prayer with me. Come on, everybody, all campuses, everybody out loud. God, give me a new boldness and a willingness 
to share the hope that I have found in Jesus Christ. The fields are ripe and ready for harvest. They're ready for harvest. Here's the second thing. The people are waiting. Lonely people are waiting for someone to befriend them. Hurting people are, are, are waiting for somebody to, to help them make sense out of their desperation, out of, out of their disillusion, out of their loneliness and despair. People are waiting. They're waiting for someone to show some smidgen, if that's the word today in the 21st century in year 2024, it, it was in, in 1962, a smidgen, just put a smidgen. They just need a smidgen of hope. Just a little bit of somebody wrap an arm around and say, you know, you matter. Somebody show them a little bit of attention. Somebody to, to in, in all their, their past inconsistencies and all their, their past failures, all, all, their, all their, their junk that they bring with them, all their idiosyncrasies, all their weird ways, just somebody who will take an interest in them and help them find a rhyme and a reason for their lives. They're waiting for someone to love them enough to reach out to them, to look beyond their sordid past, to love them like Jesus loves them, and to show them the love of Jesus Christ. Maybe just a simple invite to coffee. Maybe it's to lunch or to church or to Easter. As a matter of fact, research, you've heard this. Almost 90% of unchurched people would likely attend church if someone were to invite them. Here's the flip side of that. Only 2% of church members, and that's a broad category, only 2% invite unchurched people to church. I don't think that's necessarily true of this church, but the message of Jesus is still true for us all. The harvest is waiting. John Maxwell shared a true story of a janitor who worked every day for years cleaning up after the professors and students at a Christian seminary. And one day the janitor bumped into one of the professors as he was emptying the trash out of the professor's office. They talked about family, they talked about sports, and finally, the conversation turned toward Christ. The professor asked the janitor, hey, where do you go to church? And he said, well, I, I, don't, I don't go to church. Then the professor asked if he, if he was a believer. And the janitor said, I, I don't know. I, I guess not. He said, no, you got to be kidding me. You've been cleaning this seminary for all these years, and you're, you, you don't know if you're a believer. Why, why aren't you a believer? He said, well, I, I don't know. I guess, I guess you're the first person who's ever mentioned it to me. So close, but yet so far. Sad that it could be our story. There's a janitor in our life or a secretary or a manager or a supervisor or a coworker or a cousin or a friend in our world who might respond, I, I, I don't know why I'm not believe, a believer. I guess maybe nobody's ever mentioned it to me. Listen, the fields are white. The people are waiting. I don't want to get morbid today, but the stats don't lie. Three people die every second. 180 people die every minute. 11,000 people die every hour. 250,000 people die every single day. 91,250,000 people die every year. And in the time it took for me to read those stats to you, 57 people entered eternity. You listen to those statistics and you think, well, that's all overwhelming. You look at your workplace and think, there's, there's too much to be done just for one believer. I'm not, I'm not the only person who's a believer. I can't really make an impact. I can never make a real difference in my world. It's an old story, but I'm going to share it because it fits. The old man was walking on the beach, throwing drying starfish back into the ocean. The tide had washed them ashore, and they were drying out in the sun. So one by one, he had been down, picked them up, and slinged them back into the water. And a group of young kids were out there and said, hey, old man, you're not going to make a difference. There's Millions of those starfish out there. You're not going to make a difference. He just stooped down, grabbed another starfish, threw him out in the water and said, ha, made a difference to that one, didn't I? You can make a difference. Jesus never commissioned us to an impossible task. He equips us for every assignment in his kingdom. What has God called you to? I'll tell you, the overarching call of every believer today is to, to lead people to Jesus, to make disciples, to train them, teach them, love them to faith, and get them established in the body of Christ and in the kingdom of God. Come on, anybody believe that I'm talking to today? Say amen. The fields are white. The people are waiting. The workers are few. The workers are few. Jesus said, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into the harvest. It wasn't because God was lacking, but because we are. It's not that there aren't enough churches in this nation to reach this nation for Christ. It's that there aren't enough people in the churches who are working out in the fields. 
years ago when we were meeting, we were building the children's, what's now the children's ministry, we were meeting in the quad and I had this banner printed and we I hung it out over the main exit and it simply said, you are now entering as you left. It was over the exit door, you're now entering the harvest field. Some of you will remember a gentleman by the name of Merle Ewing which, who wrote a song that goes like this. My house is full, but my field is empty. Who will go and work for me today? It seems my children all wanna stay around my table and no one wants to work in my fields. No one wants to work in my fields. Makes you think, doesn't it? Are you guilty of sitting around a warm spiritual fire in our cozy church atmosphere? We got the coffee, we got the band, we got the lights, we got the padded chairs, we got the beautiful worship. Are you, are you, have you just gotten cozy just coming in? Are you a church family, you know a lot of people here and you kind of like it here. And are you cozy while our coworkers, our neighbors, our families, while our world suffers without the Lord who died to save them? If you are, you're not alone. There are a lot of people with you, people who believe it's the pastor's job to witness and love the lost to Christ, or it's the staff's job, or it's the pastoral team, or it's a small group ministry, or, or it's the missionaries that we sponsor to win the world of Christ. My job's here on Sunday mornings just to give my worship to Jesus and drop my tithes and offering, let somebody else take care of the world that's going to hell. Is that where you are? Or maybe you're out in the barn trying to get ready to work and you're sharpening the sickle and you've been sharpening the sickle for the last 14 years. Just can't quite get it sharp enough. Some folks stay in the barn, work getting ready and they never go out in the field of harvest because they're not confident. They, they aren't mature enough in their faith. Yet they need one more seminar, one more notebook filled with scriptures. They need to hear one more message on evangelism and maybe by fall, maybe by this fall, they'll be ready to go work. I'm not discounting preparation, but sometimes we can get so wrapped up in the preparation until we never really take the leap of faith into the harvest. Somebody's already planted a seed, most likely. All you need to do is just water it, demonstrate the love of Jesus in your life. There is an option, and that would be this. Let love motivate us, and it's simple. Just to get up and go out into the fields even though you may not have all the answers, you may not know the Bible frontwards and backwards, you may not be able to quote a bunch of scripture, even though you may not feel completely prepared, you just start where you are and God will honor that effort. Start where you are. One moment, Peter was the other disciples, they're thinking they're all drowning in the boat because the storm has caught them. And the next moment, Peter's throwing his leg over the edge of the boat and he's walking to Jesus on the water. Little faith becomes great faith when we put it into action. Faith motivated by love rises up in your heart and says, I gotta step out. Love demands that we do something with the treasure that we have inside. 2 Corinthians 5, 10 through 12 from the Message Paraphrase Bible. Sooner or later, we'll all have to face God regardless of our conditions. We'll all appear before Christ and take what's coming to us as a result of our actions, either good or bad. That keeps us vigilant, you can be sure. It's no light thing to know that we'll all stand in the place of judgment. That's why we work urgently with everyone we meet to get them ready to face God. God alone knows how well we do this, but I hope you realize how much and deeply we care. Jesus' example ought to stimulate activity in our lives to excite a new level of faith in us. I mean, what, what God did around here on, on this past Wednesday evening on our night of hope and healing is enough that we ought to, well, you know what, when, when, when our favorite sports team, when LSU girls basketball takes the title, we can't quit talking about it. When our favorite sports team takes the, the you know, wins the game or looks like they're going to the big, you know, we, we can't shut up about it. When, when some great thing happens and we get a new car or we get a raise, we can't stop talking about it. But then we let God do something great in our lives and mums the world. We flood Facebook and social media with every kind of, let me just, let me go on. <laughs> our circle of influence is in our work, our family, people we recreate with, people our kids play ball with, who they take dance lessons with, who take, they take music lessons, with. plow there, plant there, water there, and you will reap there. 
I've shared these statistics with you before, but they bear repeating. It's a snapshot of how people come to know Christ. 1% come to know Christ through evangelistic crusades and revivals. 4% through church programs. 4% through Sunday church or small groups. 5% just walked in off the street. 8% came because of the pastor. Is that all? Man. 76% came to Christ because of a friend or relative. 76%. You know what it tells us? It means that if your friend or family member goes to heaven with you, it will likely be because you did something to get them there. Probably will be a small percentage of a chance that the small group did it for them or the Sunday service did it for them. It's almost a fact. 76% of the of people on their way to heaven are going because someone else invited them. I challenge you to think about this in the destiny of your friends. We ought to start talking to God, asking God today who he wants us to, to, to bring to Easter. It's a prime opportunity. Bring them to Easter. I promise you we won't get up here and say, oh, we got all the Christmas and Easter crowd here today. I promise you we won't say that. We will not embarrass you or them. We're gonna love them. We're gonna lead them. We're gonna give them a, a word about the hope that comes to the resurrection. Get them to Easter Sunday. They're waiting on you to mention Jesus to them. Don't let them be like the janitor who said, I don't know why I'm not a believer. I guess nobody ever mentioned it to me. You mention it. People don't come because of me. They don't come because of Pastor Ryan. They don't even have a clue who either one of us are, but they will come because they love you. And I want to encourage you to bring them. We'll love them. We'll walk with them to see them connected, restored, and empowered through the love of Jesus. What an opportunity to be used in the kingdom. It's a sad story. As I prepare to close, Kitty Genovese, a young 28-year-old Italian-American, parked her red Fiat along the curb near her apartment in New York, Queens, New York, and started her, la- her la- walk home. A man appeared out of the dark and began to follow her. She picked up her pace. He picked up his pace. She started running, he started running. He ran faster. And on the sidewalk of her apartment complex, as she began to scream, her unknown assailant stabbed her two times. People immediately began to pull the blinds to see what's causing the commotion. Her assailant fled the scene, only to return again and stab her some more. Then he leaves again. She's staggering, trying to get to her building. He comes a third time, stabbing and raping her until she died with an arm's length of her door. He took her $46 and walked away. Sad story. But what makes it even worse is that Catherine Genovese didn't have to die. The whole ordeal of her stabbing, rape, and ultimate death played out over a 32-minute period. And that with 38 different people looking out their windows as she fought for her life. Psychologists and psychiatrists have, have made a hypothesis, something they call the dilution of responsibility or the bystander effect. This is simply a decrease in the feeling of personal responsibility when the presence of, when there are many other people present. I don't feel as personally responsible when there are 25 or 30 other people. Well, the man was drowning, he was splashing. Why didn't you, well, nobody else jumped in. Cases where there are many people present during an emergency, it becomes much more likely that any one individual do nothing. In essence, 30 people, witnesses felt no responsibility to act because there were so many witnesses. Each one felt the other would do something. Social psychology research supports the notion that Catherine Genovese had a better chance of survival if she had been attacked in the presence of just one person. If you're waiting on someone else to reach out to your friend or neighbor with a message about Jesus, they likely are waiting on you. The world is waiting for the freedom that comes in knowing Jesus. They're waiting to be set free from their indulgences, their fears, their chains of sin, their addictions, their misery. They're waiting for someone to weep over them in the night recesses of their privacy of their home to intercede for them. There are tens of thousands of people in Washtenaw Parish throughout North Louisiana, or in, in Caldwell, Jackson, Lincoln, Union, Morehouse, Richland, Parish, tens of thousands of people who don't even realize to this point that they're lost and headed for a very real place called hell forever to be separated from the presence of God. We dare not shirk the duty 
that is laid on our shoulders like a cloak. You, got, you, got, you, you ever seen these weighted blankets? Who's got a weighted blanket? Let me see your hand. There's, a, there's 30 of y'all. Morgan got me and 21 for Christmas. That thing weighs 15 pounds, man. I can't even move my toes under it. But let me tell you, that's the weight of this garment of responsibility that's put on our shoulders. Jesus said himself, you will receive power after the Holy Spirit's come upon you and you'll be witnesses of my name in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Let's face it, we've got a lot of work to do. We've been commissioned to do it. It's our calling. It's part of our spiritual DNA to love people to Jesus. We must go in tears. As the psalmist said, sowing precious seed of the word so that we can return rejoicing, bringing the harvest with us. So what's next for us? What's next? Here's the challenge I want to put to you. Let's begin to think about somebody who doesn't know Jesus. Begin to think about somebody who's not connected to a faith family. Begin to pray for them. Maybe they are connected to a faith family. They, they don't, there's no recognition of salvation in their life. It's okay. Begin to pray for them. Ask God to let you be a part of what he's gonna, it's going to take to reach them. I, I encourage you today to try to get them here on Easter weekend. Easter's only two weekends away, March 29th on a, on a Friday evening, Good Friday service, Saturday service, three Sunday morning services, Saturday service right here at the West Monroe location, Friday and three services on Sunday at all locations. It may be that they'll be saved on Easter. I don't know, maybe not. But I will tell you this much, you can't go wrong in planting and watering the seed in somebody's life. Begin to expect God to do some great things through you because you love people the way Jesus loved people. Do you love like Jesus loved? I know you do. So I'll just issue this challenge. Let's go be the body of Christ. Let's go be the church. Let's be the people who aren't just set on mission at Easter. But every day that we live, start your day by saying, Jesus, if you'll open the door today, I'll step through it and I'll share your love. I'll drop a little nugget. I'll just find some conversation starters. What do you think about everything that's going on in the world today? Are you, are you saved? Are you what do you think about salvation? What do you think about eternity? What do you think about God? What's your place? What place does Jesus have in your life? I don't know, but you start somewhere and let God take the lead. He will take the reins if you allow him to have that place in your life. Let's pray together. Father, thank you today for loving all of us so well who were so lost without you. Thank you for for, for talking to people, for stirring people's hearts, to, to, to stir up a new passion to win and bring lost people to faith in Jesus Christ. Lord, I, I just thank you for somebody who told me about the hope that's in Jesus. Thank you for somebody who poured water on the seed that was planted in my life, in all our lives, God. Thank you for those people. None of us are here, God, without somebody praying for us. Your mercy and grace has reached to us where we are. God, there could be some in this room right now we're ready to come to Jesus. Help us find them, Lord. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Come on, just your heads continue to be bowed right now with every head bowed, every eye closed. You're here right now in this service and you say, Pastor Tom, I'm ready for a relationship with Jesus Christ. I, I know I'm a sinner, I need God. Or maybe you're here and you, you'd say, I've had a relationship with Jesus, but I've, I've grown cold. I've, I've fallen away from the Lord. It, it's, it's become a, a sideline for me. It's, it's not something that's really important to me anymore. And I gotta get back to square, I gotta get back to my first love. I wanna get back to Jesus today. I'm not where I, want, I once was. I wanna get home to Jesus today. You know that if, you walked out of these doors and some issue happened in your life and you didn't wake up tomorrow, you're not ready to meet the Lord. You're fully aware that the way you're living your life and conducting your affairs, you may be in church on Sunday, but what happens to you on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday or what happened last Wednesday or Monday or Tuesday or the way you've been living your life for weeks or months or years now is incongruent with the life that Christ calls us to live. 
And you just need to be bold enough to say, Jesus, I'm coming home to you today. All over this room, right there in Ruston, Sterling, online, click the link, leave a, a message. Let somebody pray with you. Come on, right here in this room. Are you here today and you know you're not where you need to be with Jesus or you just need to give your life to Christ for the very first time? I want you to be bold and throw your hand in the air right now. Come on, where are you? Let me see them. Hands going up across this room right there in Ruston and Sterling. Come on. In Jesus' name, we're believing God. Thank you. Hold those hands. I want to see them. Hold them high. Let me see where you are. Praise you, God. Praise you, Lord. You put your hands down. I want us all to pray this simple prayer. Full voice. Everybody out loud. Raise your hand. Didn't raise your hand. Prayed it a dozen times before. It's okay. We're going to all pray with our friends who did raise their hands. Are you ready? Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace. When I was doing my own thing, serving the devil, serving my own sinful pleasures, you died to save me. Forgive me of my past. I turn from my sinfulness. I look to you today, Jesus, to save me. Save me from my sin. Save me from myself. I will live for you. I will serve you with the power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, put your hands together. Let's celebrate what Jesus just did.